Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover 2024 here at the Venetian in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. Uh, we are welcoming two guests to this next segment. Kit Bale, he is the Chief Revenue Officer at Cohesity. Thanks so much for coming on the Thank show. You. Mm -hmm. And Chris Klosterman, Alliances Field CTO at Cohesity. Thank you both so much for being here. Well, thank you for having us. Well, Avi, and Cohesity is a well-known brand to mm -hmm. our CUBE audience, but there's a lot of excitement going on at your company right now. You're, you're keeping very busy, Kit, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about some of, some of the, what you're working on right now. Well, we've got a lot going on. Uh, we've been very busy, as you say, lots of press releases and talks and all these sorts of things, including uh, time with you both here. Mm -hmm. And uh, first and foremost, uh, we're excited about the ongoing success and growth of the company. Uh, we're setting records, growing the business, and you know, really helping our customers solve the most important challenge of the day, which is data, resilience, and security. Most recently though, we've made two big announcements, and I'm going to let Chris talk about our AI business sure. uh, here in a moment, but uh, the big news for us is that we're in the process of acquiring the data protection business from Veritas. And so we're in the midst of that right now. Uh, we're in a quiet period, so we can't say too much, but we're really excited about the value that that's going to bring as a joint solution between Cohesity and all of our innovation, and then the last 30 plus years of innovation from Veritas and the install base, all the customers will be able to benefit from the latest and greatest tech that Cohesity brings to the table. Okay, can I follow up on that? So the one thing I think you can talk about is what parts of Veritas you're taking. You said the data right. protection business. Just explain to people, because uh, I think there was some confusion. You're not buying the entire asset base, it's right, just no. the data protection piece. What does what that entail? Right, so the, the bulk of Veritas today is their data protection business. Right. In the old terms, we would call this the backup business. And a lot of our customers, or the industry knows this as net backup. But what we're not going to bring in through this acquisition is the uh, like volume manager, some of their e-discovery tools. That's going to be spun into a separate company. So it's really about the data protection business and then being able to put that together with the existing Cohesity business, like I said, leaving the other pieces as a standalone company. As well as backup exec, right, Kit? Correct. Yep, correct. Now, Chris, talk a little bit about the AI announcement. Yeah, absolutely. So, back in February of this year, we announced um, Gaia. Gaia is our generative AI application. Uh, so, it's an acronym, like anything good in tech properly <laughs> is, right? Um, but what Gaia does is really, interesting and different than what any, anyone else in the industry is really offering right now. And the easiest way I, I'd say to, to look at it is, if we were to say, um, you know, an enterprise wants to start using AI, well, and do they mean, let's just go out and use ChatGPT against the open public internet? Is that really very valuable to most businesses? Not really, right? But what if you could do that same thing and have a conversation with your actual data? So then let's take a step further and say, okay, where in a customer's environment does all of their data exist on one platform, right? From VMs to email to NAS to databases. Where does all of that exist in just one place? Backup, that's it. That's the only place that it all exists in the same place. So with Gaia, we enable customers to have conversations with their data, right? And to actually ask intelligent questions um, that really compliance and legal teams would, I'm sure, be extremely interested in seeing. You know, things in a healthcare setting, like asking a question, has any patient confidential data been sent outside the organization, right? That's a very vague question, but if you can answer that, that's really powerful. That's really powerful to a business to help ensure you're staying in compliance without having to resort to bulk exports to e-discovery tools and then importing the data back in. So, you know, that's just scratching the surface of what it's capable of and, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see where that goes as we continue into the future, especially with HPE and some of the announcements that they've made uh, here at, uh, at the keynote with um, Antonio and Jensen this morning. How do you guys do that? Uh, is it a model that you guys trained? and tuned. Um. Yeah, so the large language model that this is based upon is called Cohesity Turing. Um, and right now, it's pa pa the chatbot powered by Azure OpenAI with either ChatGPT 3.5 or ChatGPT 4. Um, initially at launch, the, the focus is on M365, so Exchange Online and OneDrive. And that it, we ex expect, of course, is going to expand to cover everything in a customer's environment in very short order. Um, obviously can't commit to timelines or anything like that here, but 
um, you know, it, it certainly it does open up the realm of what you can do with your backup data, right? And I know we, we start, yeah. try and stay away from the word backup, but what can you do with that secondary copy of, of your data um, besides just you know, storing it on tapes and locking it away in a, in a safe somewhere like we used to do? Yeah, and if I just tag on to that, I mean, the, the real value here is in your backup, you have a fresh snapshot of your data every hour, every day, whatever the increment is. And there's no need to go build a separate data lake or a separate environment to go mm -hmm. run generative AI models. So we allow you to, to do that on the platform, on the data you already have, a copy you've already made, and then we train the, the AI on top of that. And it's all modular, so you pick your vector database, you pick your LLM, of course, mm -hmm. it's all secured. We've got all the, the role-based uh, management to make sure that the wrong people aren't asking the wrong kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've, we've built it to be a modular system. But I can tell you, we're just in the second inning of what's going to be a really exciting game here. And uh, you, know, you heard today from Jensen, every enterprise needs to get on the case here with generative AI, and we think we can give them a huge head start by using Coecity. I tell you, I, I was just playing around with the uh, Antonio avatar. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it looks pretty good. It's really good, actually. Is it? You can ask. I asked that. You know, a question that CEOs usually don't answer. What was your favorite announcement uh, at the show? And he actually answered it. Really? He said, "I love them yeah. all, but this is the one I really love." Which um, usually they, they don't answer, but he mm -hmm. understood it. People were asking him, "Can you translate that to Spanish?" He did immediately. It was beautiful. They were nodding. Mm -hmm. So it just keeps wow. getting better and better and better. We know we built our own rag. It's right. good, and it's fun, but it's not always right. Yeah, right, so, right. And uh, I'm interested in the CRO and the CTO thing, which is fascinating to me. Sure. Um, and how, how you guys go to market, what you learned from your days, kind of at VMware, mm -hmm. working with Sanjay, bringing in the, the, the field CTO mm -hmm. to really yeah. go deep for the customers when they want to peel the onion. How does that whole dynamic work? It's a great question, uh, and it's funny because uh, when I took this role on, mm -hmm. I thought I knew what a CRO was, but it turns out it's, it's a different job almost every hard day. Hard job, yeah. It's a hard Big job. Big job. Uh, and so, so, you know, my focus is always about putting the customer at the center of everything that we do. Uh, I believe the role of sales is to solve the customer's problems with the best solution. And sometimes, by the way, that is, we can't help you here, let me recommend some, somebody else or something else. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the way I look at it is sort of, my job is to pave the road, you know, make this possible. And then when, when we bring in Chris and some of his peers in our CTO group, it's really about being able to go deep, right? So when, it, when we're getting into a very detailed technical problem and we start talking speeds and feeds and mm -hmm. bits and bytes and all the, the key things that make the solution go, then we bring in Chris and, and some of the other folks from the team. Yeah. Chris, how, how, how do you think it's working? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's working rather well. Look, I, I focus on our relationship with HPE specifically. I own the technical side of that relationship globally, and you know, it's our strongest OEM partnership by far, um, and we're quite excited about that. I certainly am, and want to continue to drive that forward. We have a lot of models on offer with HPE when we talk specific hardware, but it's not terribly interesting until you start to look at the things that we can deliver to customers with those different pieces of hardware, right? What can we do with new, the new all-flash AMD solutions we just brought to market, right? That, that GA'd back in April, right? We can go denser, we can consume less power, we can do things that customers actually care about by making the right choices um, when we design solutions and bring them to, to market together with HPE. I'm going to ask you about sort of the transition of the market, generally and Cohesity specifically. Sure. In the early part of the, the 2010s, I'd even go maybe back before that, but you had the, from the storage business, if I could Sure. Yeah. I apologize for putting you in that bucket. No. But, oh, you're fine. But you had three par, you had Isilon, you had Compellent, uh, Equalogic, Left Hand, and you know, they all kind of hit escape velocity or semi-escape velocity, had great exits, and then it was really Cohesity and Rubric that, that rocketed yep. through that sort of next wave. Yeah. And it was really interesting because um, you guys in particular used the phrase data management. Mm -hmm. yep. And then all of a sudden cyber resiliency uh, became this thing and you know backup, again, sure. apologize for using <laughs> that term, no, but right, we all fine. know it Go starts ahead. with the backup. You got to <laughs> right. back the data up. Um, it became this adjacency to security and now it's like a fundamental component of security. Mm -hmm. You had an IPO recently from one of your peers, which was great for you mm -hmm. guys, like go ahead, break the ice. Yeah. Uh, you guys are making a big acquisition. So the market has completely changed. The, the parlance has completely changed from 
from backup to data management, now to resilience, and it encompasses all those things. Sure. How should we think about the business today? What is it? I think we have to start with the goal, to be honest with you. The goal of everything we do here is business resilience. How do we get there? By achieving cyber resilience. And where do you start with is data resilience. So we have to protect the, the customer's data, that's step one, secure it against unauthorized access, right? And then help customers recover from it quickly if they need it, but also give them deep insights into that data, right? And that's certainly what we are, are capable of doing with, um, with Gaia, uh, along with you know, our partnership with Big ID for data classification and things like that. So it's actually, it's, you know, I, as a former Isiloner myself, um, right, it, it, you know, I certainly see similar tra trajectory, similar you know, architecture from a scale, giant scale out file system, some number of nodes growing to as big as you want, that kind of thing. But the, the similarity ends there because what Cohesity does is unique. We don't need other applications to write data to us, right? We sit there as a vacuum cleaner and pull in all that data for you. Um, and then once we have all that data, we can do some very powerful things with it. So the, the pivot, what's happened really fundamentally is that backup was a, an IT function, right? There was a backup mm -hmm. manager, you know, somebody worked in the, the data center infrastructure, and it was a checkbox exercise. Right. What's happened in the last, I'd even say year, but we'll, we'll say it's the last two years, mm -hmm. is this has gone from being a sort of a mundane infrastructure topic to now being something that, frankly, it's a board level topic. And you know, interestingly, in a lot of cases now, it's the CISO who owns the backup budget. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be their neck on the line. If there's a problem, they need to bring the business back to life. And I think for us, where we've really spent our time, everything that Chris said, you know, the, the tech is there, it's great, it's differentiated, but ultimately our focus is, if the bad thing happens, helping our customers get back to business as fast as possible, because if you think about, you know, what it would mean for a bank to be offline for an hour, right. or six hours, or a day, I mean, it, it would be catastrophic to the global economy. Well, I actually wanted to get into that a little bit about the cost of inaction here because as right. you've said, it, the whole idea of it has gone from a box check, this is just, okay, we got to right. back it up, to right. this, is, this is absolutely priority it, because of this evolving threat landscape and, mm -hmm. and the need for cyber resiliency. So when you are talking to customers who are at varying stages of their, their journey here, how do you talk about the cost of not getting on top of this stat? Well, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you know, I, I, I ask them fundamentally, do you know how to reboot your business, right? Mm -hmm. And 99 out of 100 customers, the answer is, well, I think so, but we've never tested it, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's too, a risky. Yeah. <laughs> too risky. Too risky, too risky to actually run the test. So I, I think what's happened now, and, and Europe is actually leading with a lot of regulations, DORA for the financial services industry, which similar to GDPR is going to bleed back into the U.S. and we're right. going to have to follow a lot of those regulations. So mm -hmm. there's going to be, of course, a, a, a regulatory push and so on, but fundamentally it's this question of what, what, is, what does it cost you to be offline, and unfortunately, there have been examples where, and I'll, I'll just pick on the banks for a second, who are actually great customers of ours, mm -hmm. but I mean, uh, you know, all it would take is a very simple ransomware notice on a brand name uh, banking website, and there would be a run on the bank. I don't care how, how good the bank is, and so it, that could be their entire business, their entire market capitalization. So, you know, it's, we don't want to be in the doomsday business, but you know, this, is, this is critical to every single business around the globe, and, and not just business, schools and hospitals and mm -hmm. governments. It, it really touches every aspect of our lives. It's a great fundamental shift in the market because we all know you never backed up anything until you got snake bit. Right. Yeah. Right. And oh, like close the barn door. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the conversation of zero trust. You say the CISO is oftentimes it becomes a board level right. conversation. You know the NIST framework. Mm -hmm. you, you know data protection is is part of that. Yep. Uh, you know it's you become again a not even an adjacency anymore. It's a fundamental component. Exactly. Um, so that gets to the business case. Yeah. Whether it's TCO, it, it used to be exclusively. Uh, if we don't do this, we're gonna, we might lose data, and it's re we can reduce expected loss, was kind of the technical term, if you will, for that, sure. to quantify it. 
But now there's more than that, it's part of a business outcome. So I, I wonder, can you talk about any kind of business frameworks or business case data that you might have or customer examples? Chris, lead us off. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, I think I, I like to start, start this off when you look at the financial side of it. Um, it's not, yeah, so many people focus on the ransom, when you talk ransomware, for example. Not, not even just failing to back up, but if you talk ransomware specifically, people focus on the ransom. But what Kit was talking about earlier was absolutely spot on. What is the cost of not doing anything? Well, the average disruption period of an attack is about 21 days. So the question isn't how much does it cost you if you're down for one day, what about a week? What about three weeks, right? The time to restoration is absolutely critical. But we recently, you know, we can spit out all the numbers we want, right? But we recently had IDC, IDC jointly investigate and, ha and have conversations with our joint HP and Cohesity customers and produce a business value report um, that, that tells us that there's some substantial savings, up, upwards of 45% uh, or more, um, on the total combined solution versus legacy solutions, which is, is quite compelling, right? When you can take something that's complicated and you have a, you know, a staff of, what were you talking about earlier before the session, staff of 20 at a particular right. electronics manufacturer managing a backup environment, to now that same, that same customer has a staff of three managing double that environment. So it's really labor costs that you're, go, you're it, going after in that it, example. It, it, it's labor costs, but it's also real hard costs. Not, not just the soft costs of people, I mean certainly you can reallocate those people to other more important and valuable tasks to your business, but it's the hard costs of, of, of the actual infrastructure. It's can we go denser and save you on power and cooling? Can we simplify the environment? Right. Right? There, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of savings to be had there too. Yeah, the, I mean the math on this is pretty straightforward, right? We can do more in a smaller footprint, less space power, cooling, and by the way, if you have to manage a staff of 20 people, it's a lot of work even just to figure out you know, who's coming in today or tomorrow and covering the weekend shift when you can automate and simplify and deliver faster restore times, better, uh, like I said, better density and better performance. Right. It, it all comes together. So I agree with Chris. So we, can, we can talk about TCO all day long, but it's, it's really this, this factor of how do you actually execute a a business strategy, and again, this moves from being a technology strategy to a business strategy mm -hmm. in the most effective way. And a sustainable business strategy, importantly, too. Sustainable. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, yeah. and I mean, the, you know, I had a great conversation with a customer last night. They can't get enough power. They mm -hmm. want to add more, you know, more servers, you know, do more things, et cetera. Guess what, the grid is actually now becoming a fundamental constraint. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being, you know, sustainable in both contexts, right, in the context of, do we have enough power to, to run this, but also having something that will last for the next 10 years architecturally. And that's what we've designed for. Well, a great note to end on. Kit and Chris, thank you both so yeah. much for coming Thanks, on theCUBE. Thank Absolutely. you for having us. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante and John Furrier. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.